Let me have you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. And let's begin reading there with verse 18, down to the end of the chapter. Ephesians 6, and beginning at verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Satan is the enemy of God. And he is the enemy of God's saints. He wants to defeat you and destroy you if he can. We're told, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. The Bible warns us of the wiles of the devil up there in verse 11, earlier, which is a, a trick or a deceptive scheme. And so the coyote is always chased by wild E, or rather the roadrunner, chased by wild E coyote in the Warner Brothers cartoons. That's where they get the name from. James 1.14 reminds us that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Satan knows what your flesh wants, and he's a master at appealing to the wants of your flesh. Uh, the word entice means to allure, like setting a trap or putting bait on a fishing hook. And then he steps back and he waits for someone to take that bait or to step into that trap. <clears throat> he didn't hesitate to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ when his flesh was weak. Luke 4, verse 3, command that this stone be made bread. He's bold and brazen, I'll give him that. But you don't have to be a victim of Satan's devices because God has given to you everything you need to stand against his devices. And so you don't become a casualty in spiritual war, as it were. Um, up in verse 13, uh, Paul wrote, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Let me tell you, the evil day is here. And having done all, to stand. It's clear from the context. This section is about prayer. And prayer in your spiritual warfare. But Paul doesn't offer prayer as a weapon, but as a means to use the armor he's already described earlier in verses 11 through verse 17. Prayer is how you put on the whole armor of God. Let me point out three lessons we can draw from this section today. And I'm going to borrow language that's familiar to the charismatics, at least for the title. That is praying in the spirit. That may be the only thing we have in common with the charismatics today, but... Point number one is this. First, consider the suggestion of prayer. The suggestion of prayer. How do we define prayer? Well, the dictionary might define it as a request for help, an expression of thanks to God. So, simply put, prayer is talking to God. Talking to God. Your soul communing with the soul of the Heavenly Father. That's prayer. Martin Luther said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. You can pray in private, and sometimes you pray in public. We pray uh, with loud voices, sometimes we whisper, sometimes we pray silently. 
we set, we set aside uh, times for prayer, and at other times, prayer is just spontaneous. It's impromptu. If you're talking to someone on the telephone about some spiritual matter, uh, and, the, and you get the, the thought, you know, let's pray about that. Don't worry that there might be some government agent eavesdropping in. Just pray anyway. Start praying right there on the phone. We pray in different postures. We sit, we stand, we kneel. You pray when you're lying in bed on your back sometimes, and you're, you're having a hard time going to sleep. Because you've got something on your mind. Something's working itself uh, out in your thought life. We pray at home, we pray at school, we pray at work, we pray at church. You can pray with your eyes open, you can pray with your eyes closed. The Bible never elevates one form uh, of prayer above any other in the scriptures. The Lord Jesus prayed standing, he prayed sitting, he prayed kneeling. He even prayed for sinners as he was hanging on Calvary's cross. Father, forgive them for they... No, not what they do. Luke 23, verse 34. So you can pray anywhere about anything at any time. And the Jews prayed at least three times a day in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, David wrote, A morning and an evening and at noon while I pray and cry aloud, he shall hear my voice. Much as the Muslims pray several times a day towards Mecca, even today, Christians also have a specific time for prayer. And that time is always, verse 18, praying always. The Bible says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Romans 12, verse 12. At any time, you should be ready to pray. You should be ready and willing and able and eager to talk to God. Paul writes, continue in prayer and watch in the same, that's why you're praying, with thanksgiving, Colossians 4, verse 2. So also, let me say, at any time, you should find something to thank God for. If I ask, if I ask for testimonies once a week, don't make me milk them. Don't, listen, you should be able, quick, ready, able, willing uh, to stand and say something for which you thank God for. Give Him gratitude. And offer praise to Him. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Uh, there's no time when you don't need to pray. There's no time when you can't pray. And there's no time to pray when God's not listening. That's the marvelous blessing of a believer. To pray always, of course, doesn't mean you walk around with some solemn attitude of prayer like a monk. To pray always doesn't mean you driving with your eyes closed. There are enough jerks on the freeway doing that, right? To pray always doesn't mean you follow some uh, pattern that's found written in a religious book. To pray always doesn't mean you're counting beads on a string or, or knots in a rope and, re and, and reciting empty phrases. Jesus said, that's what the heathen do. Matthew 6, verse 7. Look it up. But to pray always means you, always, you are always aware of God's presence with you. The Bible says, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, verse 5. To pray always means your soul is always reaching toward God. That's how it ought to be. To pray always means you see every experience in life with God's interests in mind. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16. When you're tempted, you pray and ask for His help. When you see sin and wickedness, you pray and ask God to make that situation right. When you see something beautiful, you should pause and thank God for that. When you weep, you should lean on God for uh, strength. For comfort. When you're happy, lift up your voices and clap your hands or raise your hands if you have to and shout hallelujah and glory to God. When you know a lost sinner, you pray that God will help you to witness to them or bring conviction to them and save them. When your life is lived that way, 
Then it becomes a continual prayer to the Lord. You are praying always. The idea behind the phrase, watching thereunto with all perseverance, verse 18, that means you're to be steadfast, constant, and, and, and persistent uh, as your soul turns to God for help. We call each other and ask for their advice. We'll get on the internet and research a question, find out what somebody else thinks about it. We get on Facebook and talk to people that we don't know who call themselves our friends and wonder what they think about it. Why don't you talk to God first? Get off Facebook and get, in, get your nose in God's book. You'll learn more about uh, what you ought to be dwelling on than just what someone else had for breakfast. Who in the world cares? But God honors the always prayers and the watchful and the persevering prayers of his saints. Christ spoke a parable about a persistent man who continued asking for his neighbor for bread in the middle of the night until his request was granted. And then he said, I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Luke 11 verse 9. And another parable, he spoke about a widow who petitioned a judge uh, concerning her affairs until the judge finally gave in, granted her requests. And the Lord Jesus asked, Shall not God uh, avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith, especially that kind of faith, persistent faith, on the earth? There in Luke 18, verses 7 and 8. The point is that God answers the persistent prayer of the Christian. It's always too soon to stop praying, right? It's always too soon to quit praying. You say, well, I prayed and I left it with God and I'm now waiting to see what he does with it. No! You go back and you remind him that you left it there. Yeah, I don't know if you checked outside your front door, Lord, but I left a request there, and I hope you didn't, you know, hope you don't miss it. You know, um, in, that, in that parable the Lord Jesus told of the man asking his neighbor for bread in the middle of the night because his household was hungry. Um, the Lord said because of his importunity, the man would grant his request. The word importune, to importune, means you, you keep interrupting somebody with a request. They might be in the middle of something. You, you call them in the middle of their meeting. You, you text them when you shouldn't be texting them. You're knocking on their door when you know they're busy in a meeting somewhere, asking for that request to be granted. Don't let it go until you get an answer. And the Lord Jesus described that in Luke 18 as faith. He described that as faith. Faith isn't just sitting around waiting to see what happens. Faith is active. Now, faith is a noun. It's something you possess. But it's like a verb. It's something you're supposed to be doing. Don't let it go. Remember when Jacob wrestled with the Lord? He said, I'll not let thee go until thou bless me. That's what... That's what God wants you to do. That's what he wants you to do. But that's the suggestion of prayer found in our text. Next, let me ask you to consider the substance of prayer. The substance of prayer. Um, Paul separates prayer into two categories. He mentions prayers over in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 1 Timothy 5, 5. This means prayer that's general in scope, he calls this kind all prayer, verse 18, all kinds of prayer. It's the kind of praying you do that's not always specific. For example, you might pray for other preachers and missionaries. You pray for other ministries, other churches that, that are like-minded, that we have fellowship with, uh, but not in great detail. God hears those prayers and God answers those prayers because he knows the, the, the specifics better than you know them. And so you pray as best as you can with what little knowledge you have and trust that God will fill in the blanks. Um, 
I may not know exactly what uh, you need in your prayer request, but I can go to someone who does know and trust him to get involved. You know, nothing um, is harmed, uh, or rather, there's nothing that isn't made better when God gets involved. So, if someone's sick, pray specifically about that. Or I'm going to jump getting ahead of myself. He also mentioned verse 18, supplication. Supplication. That refers to a humble and earnest plea which is specific, not just general. And if someone's uh, sick, pray specifically for that. If there's someone that you know that's lost, you have a lost family member, pray specifically for them. Someone's got some serious, real financial problem, pray specifically about that. When the need is known, then the, the prayer should be specific in its nature. I thought about calling this sermon, get on your knees and beg. That's to supplicate before God. When you pray more specifically and God answers you, then there can be little doubt as to where the answer came from. It gives you confidence in your prayer life. Uh, go ahead, go, for, go uh, forward. And then he asks them to pray for me, verses 19 and 20. Paul makes some requests for himself. And his prayer request was that he might, quote, open his mouth, that he might speak boldly, that he might make known the mystery of the gospel, there, verse 19, that he might speak as he ought to speak, in verse 20. Although he was writing from uh, prison, he wanted the, the, the Ephesians to pray uh, in such a way that God would draw more people to Jesus Christ by his preaching. Uh, and by praying that way, the Ephesians would also uh, take part in whatever fruit came forth. Whatever souls were won by the Apostle Paul's preaching, others would receive, they would receive blessing as well. You and I have a part we play uh, in the work of the missionaries we send support to. We're not on the field. We don't speak the different languages as they've studied them and learned them. We haven't made the sacrifices to leave the comforts of our home and go to another country with the, the main purpose of winning as many lost people there as we can win. But when they do win one, and we've been on the supply line to make sure their needs are met, their finances are, are uh, taken care of, we share in whatever fruit comes forth. And that's the way it ought to be. Thank the Lord for that. Not everybody is called by God to, to leave everything and go be a foreign missionary. Not everybody's called to be a prison chaplain. Not everybody's called to be a teacher. Not everybody's called to be a preacher. Not everybody's called to do any number of things. But whatever it is uh, we help someone else do, we share in the benefit. I talked to you recently about the, the, um, the guy that led D.L. Moody to the Lord. Right? How many thousands of people came to the Lord because of Dwight L. Moody? Yet nobody remembers the guy in the shoe store that led him to the Lord when he was 18 years old. But he shared in the fruit that came forth from Moody's preaching. These verses highlight William Kimball. That was his name. These verses highlight two important things. First, it highlights the, needs, the need for specific prayer. It's all... If all your prayer is general in nature, then you might not know when or if the prayer request is answered. The Lord said, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. John 15, verse 16. Now next, this text reminds us that it's okay to request prayer for yourself. There's no indication in this chapter that Paul prayed for himself, but I'm sure he did. And he wanted others to pray also. But now there's a caution you, you have to keep in mind. That if you are more concerned with your own needs than the needs of the brethren or anybody else, that shows a real uh, flaw in your Christian character. Usually dwelling on the self makes the problem worse. 
And all you can see is your own self, your own problems. Little by little, that problem just grows and grows and grows in your mind. And it seems much more monumental than it actually is. And you can't see the needs of other people around you. And what you're also doing, you're cutting off fellowship from the people whose, whose fellowship you need. You want them to pray for you. You want them to help you bear your burden to the throne of God. So don't dwell on yourself uh, more than other people. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, verse 2. Pray for others and trust God to take care of your needs as he leads and directs, as he provides. But the substance of prayer ultimately is supplication for all saints. You pray for them, they pray for you. And, and lastly, consider, if you will, the setting for prayer. The setting for prayer. Paul says when we pray always, it should be done in the Spirit. Verse 18. When we speak of being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, and walking in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, and being led of the Spirit, Galatians 5.18, we mean a life that is controlled by the Spirit. That's what we mean when we read those verses. When the Holy Spirit controls your life, he, he indicates, He reveals His control of your life by producing you the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. It's not against the law to possess those qualities. What does it mean, though, to pray in the Spirit? Well, I'll give you a couple of ideas. It means to pray in Jesus' name. That's, how, what, that's what He commanded us to do. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, verses 13 and 14. That doesn't mean you can attach the words in Jesus' name to whatever it is you want. That's what the TV preachers want you to think. But it means that when you pray and are asking, when you're asking for the things uh, that will bring glory to God, it's right in the context there. You pray in Jesus' name for those things that will bring glory to God or glorify God. That's a requirement. It also means you pray according to the will of God. And the revelation of God found in His Word. And this is the confidence that we have uh, in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. 1 John 5, 14. And the Lord Jesus said, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. St. John 15, verse 7. So, let the Bible uh, shape your prayer life. As you read the Bible, I um, was reading the biography of... Uh, oh, all of a sudden his name escapes me. I was reading Bible bi biography of some Christian famous Christian, and uh, his approach was to, to read the Bible first, because he figured reading the scriptures would then give him an indication of how he ought to pray when he went to prayer. And I thought, you know, that's, that's probably a good way to look at it. That seems to be the right way that God would want you to pray and go to the Word of God first, then you'll have an idea of what it is you ought to talk to God for, uh, talk to God about that day. But praying in the Spirit means you pray trusting the Holy Spirit to help you. Romans 8, 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit knows what God wants even if you don't. And he knows how to approach the throne of God, even if you don't. 
And prayer doesn't change God, but I tell you, it sure will change you. It'll change you. If you go to work and before you get out of your car to go into your job, pray that God gives you favor with your boss, that maybe he'd open some up some conversation you can have with someone else at work about spiritual things, get their mind on the on the fact that this life is temporary. There's going to be a judgment one day and they need to be ready. Know Jesus Christ before they get to that point. Uh, it'll change your demeanor. It'll change the way you interact and converse with them. It'll set, it'll set everything in place so that God can then bring forth fruit by you. God says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. We read, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isaiah 65, 24. God is eager to hear you and he's eager to answer you. But that is only if your prayer is being shaped by the word of God and depending upon the Holy Spirit to help. Otherwise, don't, don't think you're going to get anywhere. Your prayer won't go get past the ceiling if those things aren't in place before. The Bible says no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Psalm 84 verse 11. That has to include praying uh, in accordance with the word of God and praying in accordance with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to try to begin to bring this to a close. You know, in warfare, one of the common problems has always been uh, soldiers on the ground uh, have a break in communications with their superiors. I've told you the story of uh, Hiroo Onada. He was a second lieutenant in the Japanese Army, in World War II. He was sent with a squad of 12 men to secure a small island in the South Pacific. It was a nothing island. There was nothing there but to make sure that the Allies, the Americans, or anyone else didn't make a beachhead there in that part of the world. So they went to this island, the 12 of them, and there was not much there. There was a, a jetty, or a, not a jetty, a little a dock or pier somebody had built there. You know, it wasn't much, but they didn't want anyone anchoring a boat there and being able to get on the ice. So they, they destroyed that. But they had a break in their communication line between them and their superior officers, their commanding officers. And uh, Onada, who was in charge of this group, he said, we're going to stay here and do what we were told to do until we hear otherwise. And one by one, some of these, a couple of them left and, and uh, deserted, trying to find some way to get off the island or go somewhere else and find, find uh, and give up. And uh, most of the men stayed with him. And one by one, they all died in the jungle out there. One man stayed with him for 29 years in the, and died. And Hiroo Nada was there by himself. And he had stayed in the jungle uh, doing what he was told for 30 years. Until they finally were able to reach him and let him know the war is over. You can come out. But he did what he was told for 30 years because he had a break in communication. Now, uh, even today, you know, in modern times, um, armed forces, they communicate with satellite relay. I remember in, in many years ago, civil, in the Civil War in the 1860s, uh, there would be an article about what was happening on the war front that would come out maybe once a week or once a month in a newspaper. And then you get to World War I and it would come out maybe once a week. You'd have a several days delay in what happened and when it was written for the reader. And in World War II, they'd have movie reels, which were also delayed by a few days. They'd watch them. You'd go to the movie theater, and they'd show you films giving you updates of what was happening. This was, of course, before the days of television. And then Vietnam, you have like the next day, two days later, you'd see what was happening in the Vietnam War. 
And then you get come fast forward to the the uh, the first uh, Gulf War Desert Storm back in the early 90s, and they're showing you just a few minutes delay of what had just taken place on the battlefield. And then uh, we send troops to Afghanistan, to Iraq after 9-11, and we're watching real-time video right on the battlefield being taken and relayed by a satellite to anyone in the world who wanted to watch it. Which got me to, which made me tell somebody, eventually it's going to get to the uh, point where the, the citizens at home watching the war on their television or on their computer screens will be able to call in like, you know, uh, who want, like, um, like American Idol or, or some such thing, and uh, suggest to the generals what they ought to do next. That's the, the, the rapidity of, of technology and communications. But even today, sometimes those communications break down. You don't like it when you don't get a signal to get on the internet with your cell phone. But the Christian has never had that problem. God's ready to hear, God's ready to answer 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The only break that may come in your communication between you and heaven is if your sin separates between you and your God, as Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 say. But finally, Paul finishes down in verse 24 with a prayer request, both for the Ephesians and for you and I. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Amen.